Hi everyone, and welcome to Kubernetes Secrets and GitOps Workflows. I'm Seth, and I'll be joined by my colleague Alex shortly. This isn't the first time that Alex and I have given a talk together, but before we dive in, I want to take a step back and talk about the problem. We have a problem. And that problem is best summarized in three simple words. Coop cuddle, create secret. That's right, Alex and I are talking about Kubernetes secrets again, but this time we're not talking about their security properties, but rather focusing on the secrets management workflow. Specifically, how do you get your secrets in and out of Kubernetes? Why is kubectl create secret such a problem? Well, it leaves a lot of questions unanswered without investment in other tooling and technology, like who created that secret? When did they create it? Was the value updated or is this a brand new secret? Why did they do it and who approved it? More so, was the secret even tested? Which application version or versions is it known to work with? How do we roll back in the event of failure? And ultimately, what is the source of truth for this secret? And that's really what we want to zoom in on today. In this talk, Alex and I are going to attempt to answer all of those questions by focusing on just one. What is the source of truth for your Kubernetes secrets? Now let's switch gears for a second. Kubernetes GitOps uses Git repositories as the source of truth for your Kubernetes cluster configurations. Many of you may already be using GitOps to manage your Kubernetes workflows and manifests, but either intentionally or unintentionally. And GitOps enables version control, uh, history, peer reviewing, and easy rollbacks all through versioning in Git. And best of all, we can keep our application code right alongside our Kubernetes manifest. So they're all versioned together and maintain a history. So this begs the question that if our code is already in Git and our Kubernetes manifests are already in Git, well, why not put our secrets in Git? And now I know what you might be thinking to yourself. You're probably thinking, uh, that's crazy. You've given so many talks before, Seth. Why would you ever tell us to put plain text secrets in a Git repository. This is just a disaster waiting to happen. And you're right, but nobody said anything about plain text secrets. And that's really the core of our talk here today. We're going to be focusing on workflows that enable you to use GitOps without exposing the plain text secrets inside your repositories. And then before we jump into the meat of it, I just wanna address one issue. You might be thinking, we don't use Git. This talk is totally useless for me. And that's simply not the case. While Alex and I are using Git as the example here, these concepts are not specific to Git. They would work with SVN or Mercurial or Perforce or any other source control technology that you have today. So when we say Git, just replace that with whatever you're using if it's not Git today. The core of our design is rooted in asymmetric cryptography. So let's have a quick overview of how asymmetric crypto works before diving in even more. With asymmetric cryptography, we generate an asymmetric key. And that asymmetric key has two parts, a public part and a private part. Data that is encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key. So in this example, we have Joe is retrieving Alice's public key. He's using Alice's public key material to encrypt a message and then giving that ciphertext to Alice. Alice then uses her private key portion to decrypt that ciphertext and receive the plain text, which, if everything works correctly, is the message that Joe originally created. Unlike symmetric cryptography, asymmetric cryptography requires the private key to decrypt public key encrypted information and the public key to decrypt private key encrypted information. This means that even though Alice's key is public, when Joe encrypts a message using that public key, that same key cannot be used to decrypt that data. Decryption is only possible using the private key. However, secure exchange hinges on a common format or standard for the serialization of these encrypted or signed messages. We chose the JSON web encryption format or JWE, but other message standards might work as well. 
We picked JWE because there's an ecosystem of tools, including the popular Go Jose library for Kubernetes that revolve around JWE. There's no reason you couldn't use a different algorithm or standard, but that's what we're focusing on here today. So just like earlier, we said, you know, if you're using SVN, replace Git with SVN when we say it, the same thing is true with JWE. If you have a different message standard that you'd prefer, feel free to drop that in. Again, these principles apply largely regardless of the technology choice. You might be asking yourself, why even use JWE at all? Why not just use a key management service directly to encrypt and decrypt this data? Well, there's two main reasons. The first and a little bit more practical is that Kubernetes secrets can be up to one megabyte in size, but most key management systems restrict data to 64 kilobytes in size. So by talking directly to the KMS, we would be severely limiting the size of Kubernetes secrets objects. On the security front, moreover, giving the secret directly to a key management system may be undesirable or uh, not available in certain situations depending on your jurisdiction or organizational policies. So depending on your trust model, it may not be acceptable to give the secret directly to a key management system. By using the envelope, the JWE envelope, we are giving an encryption key to the KMS, not the secret itself. So if someone were to compromise that communication, we're never actually sending the secret over the network. In this workflow, we're going to be talking about three unique people. <clears throat> now, in a small organization like a startup, one person might actually perform all of these roles. But in a larger organization like an enterprise, these are usually separate teams and separate people. The first persona is the key admin or key administrator. This person is responsible for creating and managing cryptographic keys, usually in some central key management system. They're unlikely to be familiar with Kubernetes tools and technologies. Our next persona is the secret admin. The secret admin is responsible for managing sensitive data like passwords and API keys. They're also unlikely to be familiar with Kubernetes or the Kubernetes API. And our third persona is the cluster admin. <clears throat> the cluster admin is responsible for deploying, managing, and configuring the Kubernetes cluster and any workloads that run on it. Hopefully they are familiar with Kubernetes tools since that's really what they do every day. Just like we have three personas, there are actually three steps to this process that we describe here today. In the first step, the key admin creates an asymmetric key pair, usually in a key management system. They then download and extract the public key and put it in a Git repository or give it to someone else to put in the Git repository. This key will be used to encrypt the secrets. But remember, this is the public key portion. The secret is encrypted with the public key, but it can only be decrypted using the private key, which is still stored in the key management system. Depending on your setup, you can add to this, uh, these steps. For example, you might add uh, identity and access management or approvals throughout this workflow. But <clears throat> we're just showing kind of the bare bones, most basic steps that you may need to take. Next, our secret admin uses that public key in the Git repository to create a JWE envelope with the secret contents. This envelope becomes the value of the Kubernetes secret file or the value that goes into the Kubernetes manifest. Again, just like before, depending on your setup, you can add more customization points like automation, CICD, and approvals. And then finally, our cluster administrator pulls the Kubernetes secret file or the manifest that contains the Kubernetes secret with the encrypted secret from the repository and pushes it to the Kubernetes API server. The API server leverages a mutating webhook, which decrypts the secret before storing it in etcd. Now, Kubernetes pods and services, which have proper permissions to access the plain text secret, are able to do so directly via the Kubernetes API. Let's take a look at what this looks like in a little bit more of a flow diagram. There's a lot of moving parts. The key piece here is actually the mutating webhook. The mutating webhook receives the encrypted JWE and decrypts it before writing it to etcd. All of this happens inside of Kubernetes, so the cluster admin never needs to see the plain text secret. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, <clears throat> Seth, didn't you and Alex give an entire talk about storing secrets in plain text in etcd 
And to that, I would say yes, and there'll be a link in the show notes at the end. We don't advocate for storing secrets in plain text in etcd. You should use application layer encryption with a KMS plugin, but that's a totally different topic and a talk all on its own. So Alex, why don't you show us a little bit of what, about what this might look like in real life? Thank you, Seth, for covering the core ideas behind the solution. In this section of the presentation, I will attempt to make these ideas more concrete by walking you through the important implementation points. We believe that the solution we are proposing could be adapted to a wide range of environments in both cloud and on-prem. For this walkthrough, we'll be using Google Cloud Platform for the simple reason that this is the environment we are most familiar with. Concretely, we'll be using Google Cloud KMS, but any KMS that supports asymmetric encryption would suffice. Furthermore, we'll need a place to deploy our mutating webhook, and we'll be using Google Compute Engine VMs for this task. Remember the three personas that Seth introduced earlier? Let's see how they can collaborate on the project of integrating Kubernetes secrets into their Git-based CICD pipeline. As you will recall, key admins are responsible for generating and controlling access to keys stored in KMS. The task of creating a key will depend on the vendor. But this is how this would look like when using Google Cloud KMS. Let's focus on the vendor independent components though. First, we need to select the right purpose for the key. In our case, this should be asymmetric encryption. Second, we need to ensure that JWRFC supports the cryptographic parameters we selected for this given key. Concretely, when creating an asymmetric key in KMS, key admins must choose from the list of asymmetric encryption protocols supported by the JWE standard. For the purposes of our walkthrough, we picked RSA OAP256 suite since it is supported by both Google Cloud KMS and JWE standard. However, protocols from the elliptic curve family would work as well. Next, Secret Admin exports the public portion of the key and pushes it into the Git repository. Recall that by definition, this public key is safe to store in clear text. Our mutating webhook will need to have access to the decryption API exposed by the KMS. Therefore, key admins need to grant decryption privileges on the key to the entity in whose security context our webhook will run. Whether you are running on-prem or in cloud, your environment will most likely support the concept of a service account, an identity that is linked to a service. We will assume that such service account already exists and that its name was supplied to the key admin by the cluster admin. And that is all that the key admin needs to do. Our secret admin has one responsibility. Encrypt the credential, which will eventually be distributed to Kubernetes clusters. To perform this task, our secret admin will leverage the Josie Util tool. The critical part of this step is to supply the cryptographic parameters that match those of the KMS key created by the key admin. We do not expect our secret admin to be familiar with this level of detail. Therefore, the key admin created a script that automates this task. Essentially, all we expect from the secret admin is to supply the credential to be encrypted as the input. Let's unpack the script. First, we will assume that the secret admin checked out the public key and the accompanying script from the repository. Second, the key admin supplied the path to the public key along with the credential to be encrypted as inputs to that script. The script produced a JWE encrypted envelope, which was placed into the data field of Kubernetes secret. Finally, this newly created secret, Kubernetes secret, was published to the Git repository. At this point, the only way to decrypt this envelope is by calling KMS API, which we protected by the access control list. So this is how our secret looks like in the repository. 
This is a standard Kubernetes secret. If we were to submit this secret to KubeAPI server, KubeAPI server would happily accept it. However, in this current form, it would not be much use to our applications, since they need the credential itself and not some encrypted envelope. Our cluster admin will be addressing this issue in the next section by setting up the mutating webhook. This takes us to the final stage of the project, cluster configuration. In a nutshell, the task of the cluster admin is to set up a mutating webhook. Since this is a well-documented task, we won't be going into too many details. You will recall that our key admin granted decrypt privileges to the service account provided by the cluster admin. Now in this step, the cluster admin creates a virtual machine that is bound to the just mentioned service account. This binding will allow processes running on the VM to decrypt secrets via the key stored in Cloud KMS. We use Google Compute Engine VMs as an example here. However, we believe that similar functionality of binding service accounts to VMs exists on other platforms as well. Now that the infrastructure prerequisites are out of the way, uh, the cluster admin is ready to create the configuration document for the JWE webhook and check it in into the Git repo. The next time when the CICD pipeline runs, two things should happen. First, JWE webhook will be registered with the Cube API server. And secondly, the secret that contains the JWE envelope will be applied to the configuration of the cluster. The second kubectl apply will trigger a three-step sequence. In the first step, kubeapi server passes the envelope secret to the webhook. In the second step, the webhook decrypts the envelope by making a call to KMS. Lastly, the webhook passes now decrypted secret back to the kubeapi server. If we were to get this secret from kubeapi server, we would get the secret in clear text. Thus, our applications are ready to start using it. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Seth. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. Uh, it looks like we have a few questions in the Q&A, um, but feel free to, to jump some questions in the Q&A and we will uh, try to answer them uh, to the best of, of our ability. Um, so the first question uh, says, I feel like sometimes there's a chicken and egg scenario where I'm not sure if an encryption key for a Kubernetes secret should be kept in a vault, like HashiCorp vault, for this Kubernetes cluster. And at the same time, I want to use uh, the key manager in Vault for my application level secrets as well. Should I reuse the same key management system or should I have a whole separate key management system uh, dedicated to a particular namespace? Uh, Alex, what, do you, what are your thoughts on separation of keys? <clears throat> well, I think uh, <laughs> it's a very, actually it's, it's a very interesting question. I think uh, ultimately, Ultimately, this is, comes down to this uh, first secret problem, uh, the term that uh, Seth coined. Uh, at the end of the day, no matter what you do, you will end up with some sort of initial secret, initial key that on top of which you bootstrap uh, the rest of your keys and encryption decryption. Um, so I think I would be fairly comfortable with any approach we, as long as the initial first secret first secret is stored in some sort of hardware device, uh, for example, uh, HSM or TPM. Uh, as long as we can trace that initial pass, in, initial key to the hardware device uh, and uh, you have good assurances around how 
the rest of the keys are bootstrapped, uh, I think any solution would work. Um, you know, it really depends on sort of your specific specific requirements. Uh, but that's what I would watch out for. Look for that first secret, like, and, and where, where does it come from? Because every, all problems typically start from uh, attackers figuring out how to get that first secret. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what do you think about the, the Sealed Secrets project? I'm assuming that's the Bitnami. Um, I'll add my take and then Alex, if you want to add more. I, I think the key difference is in our architecture, we really wanted to assume that the person who was uh, generating these passwords or certificates in these third party systems didn't have experience with Kubernetes. And the same would be true of the, the key administrator, right? Um, so when we were going through the personas, we talked pretty heavily about, you know, this person might not use Kubernetes. They might not be familiar with the Kubernetes API. Whereas the um, Sealed Secrets project basically automates the those first two personas that we discussed into Kubernetes itself. So it does require that the person creating the secrets um, also has familiarity with Kubernetes. And we just didn't want to push that requirement onto people. Um, but largely they use like the same, you know, asymmetric cryptography. Um, it's really just about how is your organization set up and, and where do your expertise lie? Yeah, absolutely. I would just only add, I think, uh, I think uh, there is a slight advantage of uh, what Seth and I are proposing is because uh, Bitnami relies on creating a uh, custom object uh, for storing encrypted information, which is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and there are pros of doing that. Uh, but what we demonstrated is just basically we're using plain Kubernetes secrets. So your existing application can, can be completely unaware of all this additional machinery that was introduced. Uh, so, so I think the entry uh, to production would be would be um, lower with just using JW encryption and uh, external chemist. But we love that project. <laughs> so, so the idea is absolutely, uh, idea is the, sort of the idea, the process, what it will get you are very similar. Cool. Um, so next question is, how do you ensure that the secret admin encrypts with the correct public key? Uh, for example, how do you ensure that this isn't an attacker that has replaced the public key with their own so that they can easily decrypt the secret uh, that the secret admin unknowingly encrypted with the attacker's key. Um, Alex, do you want to? Right, uh, right. So, so this is the uh, so the yeah. This is this is a good point. I, I think uh, what needs to happen here is that uh, basically the secret secret administrator. Um, the sorry, the secret administrator and the key administrator would need to do another sort of handshake. And basically, the secret, the uh, key administrator would need to ensure that the key administrator is aware of the hash of the public key that they need to use. Uh, so, so yeah, that's a very, very good point. There are also some, you know, obviously the facilities available, like in 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 systems like GitHub, where you can you can apply access control list so that attackers, you know, can just simply replace the public key uh, without compromising GitHub security system. But absolutely right. It's it's basically like with using any public key cryptography, everything comes down to uh, basically trust that you can place in the public key. Um, so yeah, um, there is a, maybe we should have made it more clear in the presentation that uh, in, in, there's a little bit more inter interaction between the key admin and secret admin. Yeah, and then there's probably some level of like established trust there, right? Like they are communicating over a secure work channel, or they know one another. Um, this is this is part of a larger classification of attack called in-band key negotiation, um, and it applies to public and you know symmetric cryptography uh, or asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. Where if you uh, you know we always worry about an attacker decrypting a secret, but what if they could just encrypt a secret with their own key and then somehow get it into our system? Um, so yeah, definitely having some level of trust, particularly using you know the signatures of the keys uh, and having some out of band negotiation. Um, cool, Alex. Do you want to read off the next one? Yep. Uh, okay. I don't understand how customer. 
I'm not sure I understand that second question, but I don't understand how to customize, by example, Helm chart to be able to use it. Uh, like, do you mean how would it? I think question number six and question number seven are the same. It says, I okay. understand how you encrypt and store passwords inside Git and Secret, but I don't understand how to customize, by example, uh, like using a Helm chart to be able to use it. So it's, it, I think it's really like, how do you get started oh. with this? Right. So as, as long as, actually, I'm not too familiar with Helm, unfortunately, but uh, I'm going to assume that somehow Helm can consume a Kubernetes secret. And if, and it, if, it, if it is true, then then you're already done. Uh, our solution does not require you to customize your existing applications. If you are using a secret today, you you can continue. Your applications do not need to change uh, in any way, shape, or form. Assuming I understood your question, because I'm not familiar with Helm, unfortunately. Um, so the next question is, um, how do you support key rotation in this model? Right. Uh, so, so this is the the key rotation in this model is actually, uh, so, so there are two components to this. So, so first component is you need to have a process to uh, basically. Um, so, I I think the the challenge here is around uh, basically the ensuring that the timing is right between you change your your password or rotate your secret and uh, basically the secret being delivered at the right time to the applications so that you basically you basically don't have the uh, you don't have the situation where you rotated your secret uh, on the system but the application is still using the old old secret so the the idea and this requires a little bit more like, unfortunately, we won't be able to cover this in detail, but we believe that the correct approach here is to basically provide sort of a backup secret. Uh, so basically, because it's very difficult to time everything uh, to the point where uh, application just starts using the right secret at the right time, we basically, we're looking at the ideas where we would send sort of the old secret and the new secret uh, through, you know, your Git workflow, and the application will basically retry uh, if, if, you know, like if the old secret fails, then we just basically try the new one. Um, so, so that's sort of our current thinking about this. But it is a, it is not a simple problem, um, and there's also issues around like how would the secrets. Uh, secret admin basically initiate the change, um, so which you know very much depends on the kind of the system they're using, etc. But but the idea of overlapping secrets, I think that's kind of what we would recommend today. Cool, uh, Alex. Do you want to read off the next one? Uh, is it number eleven? Yeah, it is. Uh, how? Uh, how would GCP Secret Manager play in this, both GKE based and Docker or GC scenario things? Uh, so yeah, uh, you can just basically uh, replace. Uh, so so yeah, I mean GCP Secret is GCP Secrets is another way to externalize your secrets configuration. So I think the decision you would have to make for yourself is if you are comfortable with if you're comfortable with externalizing secrets manager, like basically not storing secrets in Git, like basically you have only a pointer to the uh, to the secret. And basically, essentially, if you are interested in using GCP secrets, uh, I think the right approach is to use the CSI uh, CSI driver, uh, which into like there is a maybe we should add a link to the to the slides. But basically, you can. Uh, easily configure your cluster to pull the secret from GC, uh, uh, GCP secrets. And that plays nicely with GitOps, GitOps mentality because you still store everything in Git repository. Uh, it's just simply that the actual secret is externalized. Uh, so essentially, you're still kind of achieving your goals of having your Git as a, as a, as a, as a source of truth. Uh, but the approach would be different. You would need to look at CSI driver. It, it, that would be my recommendation. 
Yeah, um, I would I would just chime in that like there are some architectural differences between Google Secret Manager and Kubernetes Secrets. The biggest of which is the data format and the versioning. So by default, Kubernetes Secrets are not versioned, whereas Secret Manager Secrets are. Kubernetes Secrets are key value pairs, whereas uh, Google Secret Manager Secrets are just a slice of bytes, like arbitrary characters. So um, there are some architectural differences. Um, but to Alex's point about like externalization, if you choose to use Google Secret Manager, you would basically not use Kubernetes Secrets. Um, and then you would either consume them directly from your application using like a library or an SDK, or you would leverage the CSI driver, which I, I posted a link to in the answer to the question that basically maps the secrets from Secret Manager onto a file system or an in-memory virtual file system so that your applications can just read their secrets from disk. Um, next question is, uh, what are the pros and cons of JWE versus Mozilla SOPS? I, I don't know, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will need to look it up. Uh, it's, it's probably... Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with Mozilla SOPS. We did explore multiple formats. Uh, we look at uh, various encryption serialization standards. Uh, and essentially, the reason we chose uh, JWE is because uh, JWE is extensively used in Kubernetes, uh, within Kubernetes itself. Like, for example, we use it for encrypting tokens and serializing tokens. Uh, so it's already linked in. Uh, basically, a lot of Kubernetes developers are already familiar with this framework, uh, and it has nice Go language support. So that was the primary reason. I think if you prefer, uh, if you have strong preference for other serialization formats, it will be pretty straightforward to sort of just swap them out in this solution. Um, so we, we are not particularly tied to any particular format. Um, so the next question is, why not just use Vault instead? Um, I can take that, I guess. Um, is there two ways I could read this question? The first is, um, why not just use Vault to store the secrets directly? And to that, I think that the answer is very similar to the Google Secret Manager question that we just answered, which is, you can totally do that, but there are some architectural differences. Um, that CSI driver that I linked to in the other question is actually the same interface by which you could consume HashiCorp Vault secrets from inside Kubernetes, and you could also call the API directly. Um, Another way I could interpret this question is why not use Vault's transit backend, which is the key management system built into Vault. Uh, like Alex said in, in his person, like we're using Cloud KMS as an example, but you can use any key management system that supports asymmetric cryptography. So um, like there's no reason you couldn't use Vault's transit backend uh, to also do this like signing operations. Um, we just chose to use Cloud KMS because it's what we're familiar with. Um, do you see any problems with running the webhook inside the same cluster where decryption is happening? It's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure. I I think I think. <laughs> I think it, the the question depends on. Uh, I think the answer depends on. Uh, again, this comes down to the first secret problem. How would basically how would the uh, webhook authenticate to Cloud KMS? So obviously you need some sort of uh, token or some other mechanism for for a webhook to authenticate to Cloud KMS um, or any other KMS system for that matter. And that may represent a problem. Like, if, for example, if you uh, dropped a secret on the disk and attacker managed to compromise the disk uh, of the control plane of Kubernetes control plane, where we were presumably running that webhook, then then it is a problem. So, so I think it is important to look at the the authentication mechanism between the uh, between the uh, webhook and Cloud KMS. And I alluded in my presentation. I alluded to the fact that we are recommending to use underlying security mechanisms provided by your, for example, cloud provider or your virtualization provider. Like, for example, I showed that we could use a uh, service account, which is exposed by the hypervisor in GK, in GK or sorry, rather uh, Google, Google Compute Engine. In other words, that token that allows the webhook to authenticate to Cloud KMS is only available in memory 
and it is only available when the VBM is running. In other words, like attacker would actually need to compromise, comp gain root access on the on the control plane, which by that time basically the game is over anyway. Uh, so in other words, the it's it's important to consider how you set up authentication between the uh, webhook and cloud KMS. And if you manage to ensure that trust is based either in hardware or at least it is externalized to the underlying platform like uh, hypervisor, then I think it is safe to do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, certainly there are some risks involved in in running them at basically on the same on the same blocks. Um, so I think we're out of time. Um, I'll, I'll defer to the moderators if we have time for one more or not. They said sure. Okay. Um, so uh, in the scenario described, uh, this is number seventeen. The scenario described where the secret is available unencrypted on the cluster which is a weaker position compared to the sidecar in init container approach to decrypting at runtime. Can you contrast this over runtime decryption, which is preferred? Um, so the, the point we were making is that in this world, the secret is stored in plain text in Etsy D. So what we would recommend is that you go watch the talk that Alex and I have linked on, on the slide on the screen where there's actually a solution by which we can do application layer encryption. So the secrets are never in plain text in Etsy D. Um, and in that case, the only difference is where, like, who owns the secret? Does the application own the secret? In which case, you want to do runtime decryption, or does Kubernetes own the secret? And do you trust the Kubernetes API server? At which point, the Kubernetes API server owns the secret. In this presentation, because we're doing, uh, I don't know, I'll call it schedule time decryption, um, the Kubernetes API server owns the secret. And you're relying on like RBAC and the ACLs to make sure that um, only the right pods and services have access to it. Whereas if you do runtime decryption, you're basically saying that the application or the pod owns the secret. And you're relying on something like workload identity or pod identity to authenticate and provide that first secret to access the rest of the secrets. Alex, do you have anything to add? Or no, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, you answered it uh, perfectly well, uh, perfectly correctly. I think. Uh, Architecturally, if you think about the, uh, I believe the approach suggested in the question is to to delay decryption up until the the the, la the last point possible. Basically, keep the secret encryption until the last basically millisecond before it actually is needed. Uh, so we definitely think that's a that's a good approach. The pro the and if you are willing to change your applications and basically introduce a site, basically take the webhook. Uh, like the go into the GitHub, take the webhook, and basically create a sidecar for, out of this, like using the same logic. If you're willing to make that change to the application, uh, then that would have better security property, I think, because of the delayed. Because you you're basically delaying the encryption until the last the last possible point. Yeah, I think um, I think what we've just kind of seen from customers is that the the people writing the code might be different than the people who are writing the pod spec definition, which might be different than the CICD system that's, CICD system that's deploying it. That's why we focused a lot on personas to try to really iron out exactly what we're talking about and who does what. You know, In a world where you're the Kubernetes admin and the cluster admin and the software developer, then by all means, like run this as a sidecar. But if you imagine that you're at a larger, or, you know, or talk directly to the secret manager, if you're at a large organization where you know your job is to just write code, and you don't even know that it's being deployed on Kubernetes, right? You're just writing some Ruby code or some Go code, and eventually it gets deployed on Kubernetes. It's a lot to ask that software developer to understand that complexity and you know write all of the the YAML and configuration. Whereas um, you know this this approach that we've outlined here kind of meets in the middle of like security and developer experience. Cool. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you.